Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 37 of the podcast. And today I'm chatting with Stephanie Sebing from Quilt Addicts Anonymous. So this is Stephanie's second time on the podcast. We're going to do a little quilt market recap and also talk about Stephanie's business, which has undergone a dramatic transformation over the last few months. So if you go back and listen to her first podcast episode, she was just talking about how they had rented a space and they were going to set up a studio outside of her home. She ran an online business up to that point. Well, that studio was super successful and Stephanie ended up expanding and turning it into a full quilt shop. So I hope that you're looking forward to this interview with Stephanie Sebing and learning more about her amazing business transformation and how that's been going. Now for a few updates about what's going on around the house. I am right now in my kitchen making dinner. <laughs> so uh, I always share the video on YouTube so you can see what I'm doing during the introduction. So if you're listening to the audio, come over to my blog, freemotionproject.com and find the video so you can see me puttering around and making dinner. I'm making zucchini ravioli, which is absolutely delicious. It's really, really good. Uh, and it's basically, uh, the zucchini is the noodle of the ravioli, and then ricotta cheese, Parmesan cheese, some mint, and uh, spices go together, and that is the filling. And then I'm gonna top it with some leftover spaghetti sauce from last night. It's gonna be a quick and easy meal. I'm gonna throw it together in about 15 minutes. So I honestly don't know how this is gonna go because this is my first time trying to cook and talk <laughs> at the same time. Uh, but I will share a recipe for the zucchini ravioli because it's such a super, super good recipe. And uh, yeah, there's no gluten in it. It's not noodles. So I really like that about it. Um, anytime that I can replace pasta with uh, zucchini, I try and do that. And I don't know, I just feel better whenever I eat more zucchini rather than pasta. Uh, so, okay, uh, as for the updates around the house, one thing I'd like to start sharing are a few quotes from uh, people that have written in during the week. I love hearing from you guys, I really, really do. And I got a lot of really good reactions to last week's podcast. So last week's podcast was a great quilting debate, uh, whether to pre-wash your fabric or not. And uh, one of the comments that I got was from Helen on YouTube and she said, I pressed my seams as you do for the same reasons. I'm self-taught, so I made it up as I went along. However, my friends tell me I am wrong. They also tell me that I do my cross stitching the wrong way. Who cares? And I completely agree, who cares? This is all about doing your craft your way, you know? And I think in the beginning, we're all looking for the right way of doing something. You know, I found this definitely with photography. A lot of times I'm, I'm looking for information like, what is the right way for me to shoot this exact photo? And the answer is, it's whatever works best for me and whatever looks the best, you know, whatever I judge to be the best. Uh, and so please don't ever feel like, you know, in those posts that, um, I'm telling you that there's a right or wrong way of something. Really, I just want to eliminate the debate, you know, and show you that there is, here's this opinion and here's this other opinion. And to open that up for you, uh, of course, I have my judgment and I can't help but be opinionated. That's just, you know, what we are. We all have the way that we do things, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's right or wrong. Uh, so I got another really nice comment from Carol. She said, congratulations on your new long arm. You have just shown us just about everything on your sewing machine for quilting that there could be. You have shown us ruler work and how to join blocks and you've done amazing things with the skills you've acquired par excellence. So you will take us through the same journey with you like you started all those years ago when we will have the same thrill watching you pioneer new skills techniques and skills that show you with your charm, humility, and total grace. I am so excited for all of us to be on the ground level here with you. Many blessings. Oh, so sweet. You know, I, I really didn't know what to expect. Um, so shared the first long arm video on Sunday and I moved 
the Grace Cunique to uh, the frame downstairs. And so I shared the first video on it and I just shared like a time lapse of how that was to set up the frame and uh, the build, you know, dad and I and James working together in the room and the time lapse. Like I set this up on my iPad, the big iPad, and it was too heavy. And so the camera kept panning down <laughs> and messing up, but uh, it still turned out great. And I did a little bit of long arm quilting in that video just to show you how that works. And I think it really turned out great. I did get a little bit of pushback, you know, from people, you know, you know, a few people were like, oh, well, you're never going to share another video on using your home sewing machine. And that's not true. You know, you can share videos on multiple different machines on multiple different techniques, you know, uh, just because I have a long arm set up in the basement doesn't mean that I collapsed the Craftsy Cottage and, and took the machine out of there. So I still have the Crafty Cottage and I still have my Bernina 1230 out there and I'm still gonna be shooting tutorials on a home sewing machine. All 2018 is gonna be on a home sewing machine, our quilt along. We're gonna make three quilts together using walking foot style quilting. You know, so, I mean, I can almost hear like the justification in my voice. Um, but I, you know, I just think that sometimes we get this all or nothing kind of mentality and it was really nice. I got so many really supportive comments and, you know, only a few slightly touchy <laughs> comments. So really overall, everybody was very, very supportive. Um, so one more email that came in with a very funny photo. So Colleen and she sent me this email and said, hi Leah, I'm a quilter in our Alberta, Canada, and I followed your work for several years. I really enjoy your podcast. Today I was reading the local buy and sell newspaper and I saw an ad which I have attached. I thought you would get a laugh out of it. I know you are a woman of many talents, but I was surprised to find that goat tying was one of them. Thanks for all you do. So I will share the photo that Colleen sent me in the show notes. So it was basically an ad for a goat tying class in Canada by Leah Day. <laughs> so there is another Leah Day in Canada that is clearly very skilled too. So I thought that was really funny. And thank you so much for sharing that with me, Colleen, and uh, sending me that photo. I really do appreciate all of your comments and uh, all of your emails that you send in. Uh, really the easiest place to connect with me personally is probably Instagram if you tag me at Leah Day Quilting. If you have a question, something like that, that you really need answered really quickly, you can email us at leahday.com slash contact. That's probably the best way to get in touch with us for customer supporty kind of stuff. Josh answers those emails and if he can't answer it, he forwards it on to me. So that's really the best place to start. So uh, the few posts this week that I have shared, I'd already told you about the long run video that went up on Sunday. Uh, and I'm still trying to work out exactly what I wanna do with these long arming videos. And I'm thinking what we're gonna do is shoot a video where it's half quilting on a home sewing machine. So I share a new design, quilting on a home sewing machine. And then I share the other half of the video quilting on the long arm. And I think that's really gonna work great. It's gonna make everybody happy, hopefully, uh, where you know I share a little bit of both styles of machine quilting. And then it'll also push me out of my comfort zone because I know that I'll be able to quilt a lot of stuff on the home sewing machine that if I try and put it on the long arm, it's gonna look terrible. And it will, flat out. Like any travel stitching, any hitting points, anything like that, it's just plain awful right now. So, it's gonna push me out of my comfort zone. I'm gonna to have to show you guys some ugly stitches. And I think that's really good for me because I wanna be honest in that, um, I mean, I could shoot these videos and, and just pick designs that are easy. You know, I can stipple already on the long arm to my heart's content, but that's not really the point. You know, the point is to keep moving beyond that and to master these skills. And in order to master it, I gotta do it. You know, and I can already see myself like avoiding the hard stuff you know, just um, just because it's tough, you know? And so I think that's what I'm gonna lean into. And uh, we are on day 492 with our free motion quilting designs. So I think that's where I'm gonna start. Just pick up right there and uh, share half the design 
stitching on the home sewing machine and then the other half of the design stitching on the long arm. So it should be pretty interesting. One thing that has been a struggle and dad and I are still working on and that is getting camera mounts set up. So I shared a really cryptic picture, a like really crazy picture of, of um, these bars that I've installed over my long arm. And I said, guess what this is? And I drove people crazy because I didn't tell them what it was. Um, so basically this is a, a camera mount system that I've set up. And this was working, this looked pretty good. And dad and I were really happy with it last week. And then I started thinking like, really, it would be nice if I had some sort of mount that would be on the machine itself that would move with the machine. So then the focus wouldn't change. Uh, and so played around with that and, you know, a lot of PVC piping and playing with the camera mounts and just seeing what we can do. Uh, I think we're going to be able to figure out a good system. And there's, you know, there's a reason why there's not a whole ton of long arming videos out there. I mean, I'm sure definitely there is like definitely check out Jamie Wallen's videos. They're excellent. Um, but it's hard to set up the camera to shoot because you've not only got such a huge space to shoot, um, the long arm itself is difficult because it's so bright. It's, it's a challenge for the camera to focus on it. Um, you know, I've been doing this for years and I love filming on my machines, but sometimes it's tough to know exactly what to shoot and what angle to get. And a lot of work goes into that behind the scenes that you don't even see, just trying to get a good angle and just making sure that you can see everything I want you to. So um, that's why there's been just a little bit of a delay in these videos. So one other thing that I've been share I shared this week is a tutorial on curve seam piecing. And that was from Quilty Box. So the Quilty Box for November 2017 came with a clammy ruler. So everything in the box was put together by Latifa Safir. And her website is latifasafirstudios.com. And she designed this awesome clammy ruler. And it, it makes this perfect curved edge. So I designed a quilt pattern. It just has 16 curved seams in it. Great place to practice and just kind of get the basics of curve seam piecing in, and I call it the soft edges quilt. So you can find that at leahday.com slash soft edges. So something I've been thinking about a lot lately has been some new goals. Uh, I have accomplished one of my major goals for this year, and that was finishing the book and getting that launched. And now that that's done, it's kind of like I'm you know, taking a little while just to check in and see you know, what my priorities are. And I've been talking to a lot on the podcast, you know, and asking other quilters and the people that I interview about great work. And great work is the work that you would do even if you weren't being paid. It's the work that is soul fulfilling. I, I can't describe it in a better way than that. It does more than just um, share something, you know, like, you know, how to how to piece a quilt. It's, it's more than that. Uh, and I've been thinking about this a lot because I want to do more great work, you know, in the coming year, definitely, but even right now, and, you know, thinking about what that means for me. And it was interesting, I was on Instagram and just, you know, scrolling through and someone posted a magazine and, you know, that they were reading it. And I, almost instantly, I was like, that's the magazine I want to write for. <laughs> uh, so I checked it out and I checked out what they're like, upcoming topics were about and it just it felt like like the perfect fit so that's something I'm going to pursue uh in it you know I'm, I'm not going to tell you the name of it I'm just uh I'm just it's just a private goal just to pursue that um to write more about um not just quilting but like the life side of things the creativity side of things you know um being more connected and uh, more present and then also making and creating and crafting a life that works for you. I want to write about that more. And I, um, I really want to share that more because I think it's really, really important. It's something that I really value. And it's part of the reason why I love doing this podcast. I love being able to share our reality and, and how we live. Um, so that felt really cool. And I've been thinking about a lot, uh, you know, just connectedness and being present. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about the future. You know, what's coming next? What's the next post? What do I need? You know, what's the fabric calculation? What do I need to figure out? What do I need to test? And there's a lot going through my head at any given time to the point that sometimes I'm a little distracted and Josh might say something to me 
And then I'm like, when, what, <laughs> when did we have that conversation? I don't remember. And he's like, well, I told you that last week. Well, you know, it went in one ear and out the other because I'm, you know, just constantly thinking about quilting and focused on that so much. And so one of my goals uh, is really to become more present and to put work down at the end of the day and to make a declaration. This is the end of the day and I'm putting this away and I'm going to stop thinking about it, grinding on it, you know, just, just running it over and over in my head and stuff and constantly having that, you know, source of worry, I guess, in the back of my head too. So I think that'll be really good. I'm already starting to figure out what my word is for next year, which is really exciting. Uh, and that's something that I always do. Uh, and I think it's really important to usually lasts for about six months or so that I feel guided by a particular word. Uh, so last year it was um, simplify and open. And uh, I think that's a large reason why I was able to get as much done as I was able to last year and, you know, adding new things like the podcast because I simplified a lot and I stopped being so nitpicky about a lot of things and uh, stopped wanting things to be absolutely perfect. And that enabled me to do more and uh and to accomplish more things you know if i'm sitting there just you know oh it you know has to be redone i need to reshoot that you know i need to go make that video all over again from scratch because it you know i made this one little mistake or something like that uh i'm not you know exaggerating that used to happen <laughs> and it used to really stick me in place and slow me down uh and so i think simplifying and being open to things changing and being different and all that kind of good stuff really guided me through 2017. And then about halfway through this year, my word changed and it became trust. And, you know, trust the process and trust the system and trust, you know, that everything with the book was going to be okay and all of that good stuff. So I really believe in this. I think it's really important. I think it's good to tap into a particular word and let that guide you and see where it goes. Um, and... I really like the idea also of writing more about, um, about lifestyle and about happiness and yoga and all that good stuff. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that and I'm definitely gonna pursue it. If I get into the magazine, great. If I don't, that's okay too, because the point is to write and share and enjoy that process. Uh, the benefits of being in the magazine are kind of secondary. So I hope that makes sense. And I'll definitely keep you posted. You know, I have no idea. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna put up a post and see if they like it and we'll just see. So uh, what else have I been writing? I have also been working on my fiction novel, uh, my book about Mally, a little girl named Mally. And so I've also been working on that and it's been going really well, but I think I kind of, I lost the thread of some of my characters and they start doing stuff that they wouldn't have done. Like, you know, kind of like, that's kind of not really how she sounds, you know? And that's not really the way he talks to people either. And then there wasn't like really enough conflict <laughs> in a scene or two. I think that needed to be edited a little bit. And, you know, it's a choice of, you know, do I go back and fix it now? Or do I wait and fix it later? And ultimately I decided to go on ahead and fix it now while I was thinking about it. I didn't want to potentially leave it in um, because it did affect stuff in the future. But I'm about at the halfway point of the book overall and that feels great. Um, you know, just kind of slowed down a little bit as far as how much I was writing. Uh, just kind of had a time shrink over the last couple of weeks as far as just how much time I could put into it. And I'm hoping uh, in December, I'll be able to open up more time and be able to take it out, you know, take my iPad out to the crafty cottage maybe and sit down and spend a whole day on it, you know, do some stuff like that. Unfortunately, my heater in the crafty cottage decided to crack in half. So like a wall ceramic heater. So that needs to be replaced. Uh, and that's something that is really important. I set that up outside and set it up with a thermostat so it would keep the crafty cottage at a minimum temperature overnight and then kind of crank it up in the morning so that by the time I'm going outside about 10 o'clock in the morning to film, it would be about the perfect temperature for filming. 
Well, it cracked right across the middle, so that's completely out. Dad was like, unplug it, <laughs> don't leave it on. So I was like, maybe I could get away with it. Nope, 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 dangerous. So um, unplug that and I need to order a new one and then I can get back to my normal schedule. And no, you know, it's just nice to trust, to go out there and trust that it's gonna be nice and warm and toasty, but not too hot. Um, I, I know this sounds a little picky, but you know, it's just, it is really hard to be a good instructor and a good teacher when you are physically very uncomfortable. Um, it's just impossible, you can't do it. Uh, or at least I can't, I can't be freezing cold and like, ah, this is how you piece curve seams. <laughs> it's just not gonna work. <laughs> so that's really the updates for around the house. I've had a wonderful time cooking as I shared these, uh, this intro with you. I hope that you haven't mind the clinking and clanking as I was uh, stirring together my uh, zucchini ravioli. If you'd like to find the recipe, you can find it in the show notes. You can find all the show notes for all of the episodes that we've shared so far linked up together at leahday.com slash podcast. And of course, one last update, and that is the book, Explore Walking Foot Quilting with Leah Day, is available for pre-order for only two more days. So if you would like to get a signed copy of the book, make sure to come to leahday.com slash walkingfoot to pick up a copy and get a great deal on your book. So come and check it out, leahday.com slash walkingfoot. And now here's the episode with Stephanie Sebing about transforming her online business into online and a brick and mortar quilt shop. Hello, my quilting friends. Today, I'm here with Stephanie Sebing. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, Stephanie is our first returning guest. This is so Ooh, exciting. So <laughs> now, a little introduction, just in case you haven't heard that first podcast with Stephanie. She is a quilt pattern designer under the name Quilt Addicts Anonymous. She also owns an online shop and a brick and mortar quilt shop under the same name. So she is a digital marketer and she grew her blog into a business when she started treating her own business like a client after the birth of her daughter in 2014. Her goal was to be self-employed and out of the crazy world of ad agencies by the time she had a second child. But three years later, she still has just one kid, but she employs herself and her husband full-time and has three part-time employees keeping Quilt Addicts Anonymous running. So Oh my gosh, that is so much stuff that has changed since the last time I talked to you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, when we talked last, I had signed the lease for the space, and it was like a thousand square foot space, but it used to be a restaurant, so there was this big like counter space, which I was really excited about because I was going to be able to prep all my online orders and my quilt kits and stuff there, and then just have a little bit of retail space, and I was just going to be open two days a week and one Saturday a month, and that was it for our local people. And... We had a really big um, reception right away. There are some shops here locally, but none that really specialize in modern contemporary fabric, which is what I have. And so we expanded right away. The space next to us became available, and we kind of looked at it and were like, if we don't take it, you know, we're going to regret it a year from now. And so it was a stretch, but we took it. So now we have 2,000 square feet about, and a whole lot more inventory. We, I think about tripled or quadrupled the amount of fabric that we have in the shop. Um, so we went from having like, I think it was like 200 products, most of them patterns to we now have over a thousand in the store to keep track of. And we're now open five days a week and one night a week and I've got staff and I didn't really this was not my goal. It just kind of happened. So I'm glad it did. I don't know where we'll go like from here. I mean, I have some ideas, but we're going to let the numbers kind of decide. Sure. So what, what are. so, so kind of tell me the transition. So you, you first opened the, sh the studio. That's what you were talking yeah. about last time. So you opened the studio and I can remember around this time you posted to Instagram, a picture of your front door and it had like, we're open every other third Tuesday from two o'clock yeah. and like by appointment. And I can remember somebody commenting like, wow, those are really weird hours. <laughs> well, cause I, I wanted to have time to work. I just, we, around the end of last year, I had bought uh, some fabric from a quilt shop that had closed and it was boutique. So like they never really 
go out of style. And I just had fabric lining every wall in my house, and I knew I needed a space outside to work. So the rent was pretty reasonable, and I figured there would be no problem making it, and so we got the space, and it was just supposed to be, you know, I just wanted it to pay for itself. That was my only goal. And, but it was pretty clear right away that people wanted more. So we opened the second side when that came available in April, and then we had an increase in hours over the summer after I finished my book and got everything turned into the publisher. Because I just didn't want to be in a situation where I would have to pay people on the off chance somebody would come in to that would need help when I needed to do things like meet a book deadline. Yeah. You know, that can get pretty expensive. You don't necessarily make enough from the book to make it worthwhile paying somebody an hourly rate for maybe somebody to pop in. And so we waited until that was done. Then we expanded our hours. And it's, it's been interesting. Our online growth has gone much faster than our in-store brick and mortar growth. I quite frankly don't know how brick and mortar stores do it. If, if you've been there for a long time and you're established, I think that's one thing. But if you're new and you're all of a sudden buying all this inventory and you're trying to make that money back plus pay yourself, I think that that's a really hard thing to do if you don't have online because our online um we had the accountant from hell and so we finally have a new one and have all of our books straight and I was able to kind of look and see how things grew with our different business segments and our online doubled from q2 to q3 whereas our in-store sales just went up just a little bit so you know it's growing it pays for itself it makes money but we certainly wouldn't be able to do what we're doing if we just relied on our in-store traffic. Totally. Yeah. That's, that's the main reason why I've never pursued it. And, you know, and also cause Josh has no desire to work in a shop. <laughs> like he's not <laughs> shop material at all, but uh, yeah, that's, that's always been kind of my worry is that I would open a shop and then it would be the online stuff and then it would be a double hustle. Have you been feeling like that? Like a, like you're working twice as hard to do basically the same thing plus even more with the physical storefront. So I don't regret opening the storefront because we wouldn't have been able to grow to the point that we have if we hadn't done it and had the additional inventory to sell. Um, I think that was a great move for us and it was a good move to make at the time. But 2018 is going to be our year of measurement. So we're going to be measuring not just the net of all of our products when they sell, um, but we're also going to be measuring employee time and my time and my husband's time and what it's being spent on because I have a suspicion that I basically have a really pretty warehouse and that it's not actually making that much once you take out, you know, the time that's included and all the overhead that goes to having a shot because, you know, when you double your space, your, your rent and your utilities and everything else doubles too. And so... That's my suspicion, is that at the end of the day, it's not making that much money. And so now that we have a really great accounting team, um, which if you're not good at that, you need to get a really great accounting team because, like, I can calculate ROI, but I am, I'm no good at looking at taxes and figuring out any of that mess. And so I'm really looking forward to the new partnership with them to be able to sit down and say, okay, here's what our actual net is from all these places what is going to be our best move going forward? Um, like yesterday we had two customers at the shop and they were good sales, but you know, it was kind of nice because I just wanted to like do nothing after quilt market. So I was totally fine with it not being a busy day, but you know, it's a problem when you're like, gee, I really hope nobody comes in today. Cause I don't want to, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk to anybody because I just talked to people for eight days straight and I, I'm done for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> like and you're probably a little bit like me and introverted. Like, how has that been, you know, not just to um, not just to be able to, like, stay at home and design and write and, and plan. Like, you do massive quilt alongs and stuff like that, too. How has that been now to have this in-person element that's now a requirement five days a week? It has been very challenging. We've dropped the ball, definitely, on getting our video tutorials out in a timely manner. And so I've got staff in place now that I trust 
where I'm going to have Wednesday as a work at home day for me from now on. And so I'll use that day as my video tutorial shoot day. So that way I can get those done and then I can hand it off to my guy who does my editing and we can actually get those out in a timely manner. We've decided to delay the launch of our 2018 block of the month. Uh, normally right about now is when we start taking signups, but we're going to wait until January because I want to make sure that I have all these videos shot, edited, and ready to go because I don't want to let people down because I get too busy and crazy. I want it all to be ready to go when it launches. So that way, you know, we just put all the videos up and people can follow along at their own pace and they can get stuff done and they're not worrying that, well, is she going to put the video out? Because <laughs> yeah. I know that, that I failed at that this year. Mm -hmm. And it's not good. And so, you know, it kind of stinks because it's like, you know, we're paying people. My husband's there every day, but he's not going to be able to help you pick up that work. Um, he knows our inventory pretty good, but he doesn't, like, he's never going to tell you what pink goat's good with that purple. Like, that's not, <laughs> he's never going to be able to do that. That's okay. Um, he handles a lot of the shipping and, and everything else, and I'm glad to have that off my plate. But that was the really hard part, is how do we continue to, you know, deliver that educational element and do everything else that we've been doing, like writing a book and doing everything for cult markets and working with brands. And it's been a huge year of growth, not just with the store, with everything else, too. And it's I failed at that big time. So that's my other big change is making sure I carve out time for myself. And I'm going to try to actually take Sunday as a family day and Monday as a clean the house and me day. I don't know how well that's going to work, but I'm going to try. So we're going to see how it goes. I wouldn't call it a failure. I think that all of this is just like the natural adjustment. I mean, if you want to think about it, like your second child is this quilt shop. I mean, really. Basically. And, and <laughs> it, it takes what, like six to eight months to adjust to a new baby and kind yeah. of get the, the whole game plan going. So I would not call anything a failure yeah. at all. It's just that growing pains, that adjustment of things changing so much. Um, have you considered maybe shrinking your quilt alongs, making them a little bit smaller, a little bit shorter, so they're a little bit more manageable? Not so much at that, because it's it's a huge revenue source for us. Um, when you have that recurring revenue, especially at the summertime, when people just don't buy that much quilt fabric, that's really key. So it's important for us to have it one or two going all the time, because that's a big portion of how, you know, we pay the bills each month. Um because we sell fabric to go along with it, and it's just like a monthly fee, and a lot of it, you know, I passed off, like I haven't cut a block of the month in, I don't know how long, I don't cut our stash in with Stephanie at all, I pick the fabrics, but then somebody else cuts and folds it and arranges it, so I've learned to delegate the things that aren't necessary for me to do, so that's good, yes. but if I'm the only one in the shop and somebody comes in, you know, I've got to stop and help them. And so if I'm on a deadline, I still have to be very pleasant and helpful for how long they need it. And then I can get back to what I'm doing. And that usually means working around the clock. And so that's what I need to try to get away from where I'm building in time for me to work so that I can meet those deadlines without having to be there all night you know. Sure, sure. I completely understand. Now, I can remember when we talked about using Google Analytics to track income, we were talking online. Uh, uh -huh. And I know that you've started to use some of that same tracking uh, knowledge in your actual physical store. So tell me about that. How do you track your income in the store? That's a lot harder. Some stuff we can tell. Um, like if we have class signups, you know, and they come from online. Like our beginner quilt team, most of those people come from online and Facebook. And so that's easy to tell because they still sign up online. I can tell if I send out an email and somebody pops in immediately to look for that thing that's on sale that, that you know, made us money. But it's a lot harder to draw the line from this link made this much money when it's online. Um, so that's why our focus is more going to be on um, I mean, we kind of have an idea of what does it. We can't say specifically this email made us this much, but we can um, measure how much we're actually making minus our time and overhead and all that. So that's why the focus is going to be on 
measuring the actual net revenue instead of just gross, which is what we've been measuring, and then also measuring employee time and how that's being spent so that we know, do we just have a pretty warehouse? Is that all it is? Um, Or are we actually making more than we think? And are you able to track like a section of your store? So like, you know, setting up like all the boutiques in one corner and saying, well, you know, that corner does really, really well. Like, have you done anything like that as far as tracking how the store is going? We haven't. Um, we could. I, I found this new plugin, which if you uh, use WooCommerce, a lot of people do, um, is you can, there's a point of sale system with it, which is what we have. It updates our in-store inventory at the same time as our online. So if somebody buys something in-store, then we can also, um, it manually updates with the online inventory as well, so that way we don't double sell something. But it also will separate our sales from our online sales versus our in-store, so I can tell pretty easily what's in-store sales. I can segment that if I want to. Um, But honestly, a lot of our time and measurement this year has been taken care of up by fixing the mess from this accountant from hell that we no longer have. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that. (laughs) So bad. Okay, so here's the story. When I was at Quilt Market, my husband at Spring, my husband sends me this text message that shows that our business license has been revoked. And I'm like, what? No! Basically, my accountant sent in the wrong stupid form and we were registered as an out-of-state seller instead of an in-state seller with a brick-and-mortar location. And it got fixed. It was fixed by, like, Monday morning, and it was fine. But, like, that was kind of my last straw. I was like, okay, I'm done. We're not going to be with you anymore because clearly you don't know what you're doing. And so now we have this whole team, and, like, we're going in next week to sit down with them and look at the books and figure out what needs to be spent by the end of the year so that way, you know, our tax liabilities are not out of control and, you know, do some future planning. So, you know, that's, I'm so glad to have like a real team. So if you're going to do this, you need a really good accountant, not just a one man show that somebody says might be good. Yes. I completely agree with that. I have both a bookkeeper and an accounting team. The bookkeeper kind of keeps the monthly books and, and he, you know, has access to lots of different accounts and kind of keeps a look on that. And then my accounting team does my taxes and we uh, incorporated. Have you incorporated yet to form? We did this year. Well, the previous accountant said she did, but didn't actually. So the new accountant is like filing some appeal thing, but supposedly that's in process. I, my jaw just dropped. I cannot believe somebody <laughs> would do that. I, I, becoming a corporation, just in I, case, it's it's a lot of, of paperwork, and there's a lot that goes into it. And then to remain in legal standing, there is paperwork you have to continually file. And I'm just kind of shocked. That is so over the <laughs> it's top. So bad. It's so bad. Like, you know you're in trouble when you get, a, like, a letter from the IRS. And it's like, uh, but we paid this tax. <laughs> What's going on? So... That's fun. So we've now paid a couple of things twice, and our new accounting team is, like, trying to get, you know, part of it back That's because the... they got put in the wrong account, and it's like, oh, Lord, <laughs> like, what else can go wrong? So I oh. think hopefully we've discovered everything that's wrong now, and, but yeah, that's taken up a lot of my headache this year, is getting that situated and fixed, and it's a huge mess, mm-hmm. but it's almost cleaned up. So that's good. Yeah, that is good. I'm so, yeah. so sorry that happened. That is, I th- I'd say, one of the most essential things to have for a running a business. I tried to do the books myself for about three years and do my taxes, too. And I reached a point where I was just like, my time is better spent handing this off to somebody else. Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. It's so worth the money. Yeah. So worth it. Yeah. And that's one thing that I don't question whatsoever. I'm like, okay, yep, I'll pay you. <laughs> No problem. Well, I know that you're really, really tired today. And the reason that you're so tired is because you've just yeah. gotten back from Quilt Market. So tell me how that went. So I wanted, we talked a little bit about this before we went live, but I wanted to do a booth because next spring I've got a book coming out in June. So it's going to be promoted at Spring Market in Portland. So I wanted to do a booth this time. So that way I would figure out what I didn't know about doing a booth. So that way I would be a nice well of machine by the time we, it really matters and I'm promoting a book next year. So we learned things like, even though I'm very digital, everybody wants a paper brochure to hand out. So I've got to have that next time. 
Um, we did Hard Walls, which I drew out the plans for. My husband executed, and it all stood up, and we were pretty pleased about that. And then as soon as I finished, I was talking with Tula Pink, and she told me about her process of using Foam Core Board. And I was like, I wish I would have done that. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, well, it, live and learn. So we'll use this one at least at other time. And so you'll have to, to get... Will you have to yeah. drive that all the way to Portland? I mean, I know you live Probably. in New England. Um, I just, I didn't want to deal with shipping it. We put, broke it down into four by four pieces of plywood. So that way it would fit in the back of the van. And we did drive all the way to Texas. And then we drove all the way back from Texas after doing Quilt Market. And it was just, it's exhausting. Quilt Market is already exhausting. Then you add that drive on it and it's even more. Um, I did hear from basically everybody who was there that it was slower um than previous markets i think people were concerned that it wouldn't be put back together but it, it was at least in the downtown area you couldn't tell that anything had happened um as far as the hurricane was concerned um we certainly met people who had been affected by it while we were there um quilt shop owners in texas who you know still aren't reopened because they have to replace sheetrock and all their inventory and it was just it's sad stories um, but if shop owners stayed away because they thought it would be a mess, they were wrong. So, but we got some good contacts out of it and we made some good sales. Um, most of them came actually from Sample Spree. So if you're considering doing Quilt Market and you're not sure if you want to spend the extra money to do Sample Spree, that's probably where you're going to make the majority of your money. So don't, don't skip Sample Spree. So if we would have been in big trouble, we would have at our place. So What did you primarily sell there? Was it mostly patterns? I did just sell patterns. Um, that was it. Uh, because, you know, they're going to buy all their fabric elsewhere. And it doesn't make sense for me to sell kits to quilt shop owners because they can just buy it wholesale and do it themselves. Um, so what we did was we just sold the patterns. And for Sample Spree, we did like a six-pack of patterns. And we priced it so that you would get one pattern free. And then we had one of each of our block of the month books, which was not as popular. Um, and we just knocked like a buck off the price of each one of those. So Sample Spree is where we did the majority of our sales. We had a couple of good sales um, during the show. but And most of them came. I was collecting everybody's email because I didn't have flyers to hand out. I was like, well, give me a business card and I'll send you everything through email. So each night I would send people a thank you email and let them thank them for visiting the booth, send them images of all the quilt patterns that I had. And we had people come back and then buy the next day. So that was really worth it. And we, if that's daunting to you to send out 50 emails, you need to have an email marketing system for this because all I had to do was have an employee put everything in to a spreadsheet for me and then I just uploaded the spreadsheet and was able to send a personalized email out to everyone and I only had to make that email once so that was a good deal so yeah yeah that sounds like that worked out really well so um for your book uh, just a little like I, I love knowing what's coming up so tell mm -hmm. me about your book and did you partner with any fabric uh, manufacturers to do the fabric for the book did you do anything like that yeah we got the book or the fabric for from fabric manufacturers for that I think there was only one that I one I bought the fabric and two I already had it in the shop and so I just used that because I liked it but for the other nine we got fabric we got a lot from our gallery which is fabulous to work with it's so soft and silky and it was really fun to work with their fabrics. Um, we did some of cloth works. We do a lot of stuff with cloth works. So we use their uh, shades line because I just love ombre. And um, who else did we work with? We worked with Ink and Arrow. And that has turned out to be a really good partnership that is continuing for some other projects. I know I'm going to forget somebody. Hoffman. We use the Me and You Batiks. So... Um, we'd use their modern batik line because I've used a lot of batiks in the past. And so I felt like I needed to have a batik in there, but it was all more modern and contemporary designs. So I wanted to make sure I used a more modern batik for that as well. Cool. And what's the book topic about? Um, it's going to be called Simple Quilts for the Modern Home. So it's 12 quilts ranging in size from lap to like queen slash king. And they're all look 
well, some of them look easy, but some of them look pretty complicated, but they're actually pretty easy to make. So we break it down so that way you can see how you can do these in a weekend. And I'm working with Landauer. They're my publisher. And so that'll be out in June sometime. And so they've got all the quilts and we're talking about doing photography and all that good stuff. But my portion of it is mostly done for now until we get to the promotion part. And so I'm pretty... I'm glad to have that, you know, off my plate for a little bit. Yeah. Are you planning on doing another one after this? Um, we have talked a little bit about it. When I did my proposal, they literally replied with, for your first book, we think you should do this, <laughs> and then you can do this one for your second. So I think there probably will be another, but we haven't specifically talked about it. So yeah. I just want to get this one done. and. Series are where it's at, you know, really, yep. uh, you know, I, I, I've started a series with my newest book, it's going to be the Explore Machine Quilting series. And so uh -huh. every book that comes out will be a part of that series. And I think that that really helps the overall sales uh -huh. as far as, you know, one book adding to that, then everybody wants the whole series, you know, uh, so that's <laughs> something to think about. It was originally proposed as a baby quilt book. So simple quilts for the modern baby, because I was thinking back to when I had my daughter, and, you know, it's so hard to find a baby quilt pattern that doesn't look like, you know, it was designed in the 90s. And it's cute and it's fun and will work with any decor. Because you see all this stuff on Pinterest and, you know, it's all these fabulous colors, but you can't necessarily find that in lines. And so I wanted to do one where it was all solid prints. And then that way, mom or grandma or whoever is making this baby quilt can just say what colors are going in your nursery. They can literally take an image from the Pottery Barn Kids or wherever the stuff is coming from, and they can bring that to the fabric store with them or look at, you know, a color guide of their favorite, you know, solid and choose the ones that work and make that quilt. And you don't have to worry about... You know, like I did my kids' room and dogs, and when I bought the fabric, like I thought I was pregnant, like the month I came home from our honeymoon, and then it was like five more years before we had Aww. a baby. And so, I I had this fabric when I was like super excited and 24, and <laughs> just <laughs> bought a bunch of dog fabric that I was going to use for my first baby. Well, by the time it came out, dogs were not a thing anymore. So I had to do, like, I custom painted her dresser, and I custom ordered artwork on Etsy in order to get stuff that would coordinate with everything. And I made the balances, and I made the fabric baskets. And, you know, when it's a first-time mom, you have time to do that. Yes. Next slide, I will not. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> oh, completely. And I think that that's such a good idea. I mean, I absolutely think yeah. that, you know, a modern baby quilt book would be wonderful. So I, I really hope that you take that on and start that next book. That's going to be great. We'll see. That one would be a lot easier to make because they're a lot smaller. Much faster, much smaller. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, one last question about Quilt Market. When I go to Quilt Market, I didn't go this year, but I'm always looking out for trends. Like, what is that thing that keeps popping up and, and I keep seeing it over and over again? Was there anything that you saw at Quilt Market this year that kept coming up? There was a lot of cork. People were really excited about cork. And not just like, you know, the plain cork that you're used to seeing for bags, but like pattern cork and printed on cork and different colors of cork. So that, that seemed to be a big thing this year. We were next to a table at Sample Spree and they were like sold out within the first hour of all their cork samples. Wow. It went crazy. Yeah. So, I've been wanting to play with that. So it's like the leather, like the leather um, alternative cork fabric is what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. And so it's supposed to be really good for bags and other craft projects. So that was really kind of a big thing. Um, there's a lot of bright stuff out there right now, um, which I appreciate. It makes it hard for me to pick what's going in the shop, but it works well. Certainly. So this is the question I always ask, and I remember your question in the last podcast episode was all about your new studio. Uh, what are you most looking forward to in the next five years? I know it's probably changed between the last eight months it and now. Changed. So our lease is for, we have like another two and a half years on the lease. So our, this is our big goal is to measure like crazy next year. So that way, when it comes time to look at the lease, we can 
really make a decision based on numbers rather than gut because I've gone with my gut and it's done me pretty well so far. But I want to make sure that whatever decision we make about the future of business is really based on solid financial figures, you know, whether it's to continue with the store or to just buy a big house and move it all back into a house and just have employees come there to work. I don't know. Um, but we're going to just spend next year really measuring our net profit from the wholesale side, the e-commerce side, the brick and mortar side, and keeping track of not just, you know, how much money are we making after we pay for our costs, but also, you know, employee time and how that's spread out. Because, like, when I took a look at it, I saw, like, what percentage of our business was going to different areas, and... You know, our brick and mortar is like a very distant third from e-commerce and wholesale patterns. And so I want to make sure that the time we're spending is reflective of the, you know, the, the gross we're getting out of that. Certainly. You know, I want to make sure that we are putting our time and our resources, because time is a resource, yes. where we know it's going to benefit um, our employees, us as a family, and our business. Because if you're going to work all the time, you need to be able to enjoy the benefits of that as well. Certainly. So. I completely agree. The, the, ter- the kind of quote that's coming to mind is, is the juice worth the squeeze? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, that was like, like as soon as we finally got our book straightened out, it was like right around the time when I also had to figure out what went where for sales taxes. And so I like listed everything out. And then I did a like an estimation because we haven't used the plugin yet to determine net sales. We're just no gross. So since we do a lot of sales, it's not like I can say, well, half of this is profit because it's not. And so I did kind of an estimation of what I thought our average net was from a, an e-commerce sale. And I was really, I mean, I knew e-commerce was going to be number one. I didn't realize that the net from wholesale patterns was going to be so much higher than net from brick and mortar. And I was like, you know what? We are spending so little time on wholesale, developing those relationships and, you know, reaching more quilt shops and getting our patterns in more quilt shops. We're spending so much less time there than we are in the shop. And the shop is bringing in so much less at the end of the day that we need to fix that. Because obviously this is a really great area of growth. We're able to control the cost of the ultimate product, which means we can keep a whole lot more of it. So that was really eye-opening for me to know that. So I just, you know, you know me, I like my data. And (laughs) I want more data so that I can make good decisions. I completely agree. And I, I really wish you the best of luck. I hope it goes really well. I hope you get the numbers that you're wanting and yeah. that you're able to build the business and do what you want. That's where it's at, really. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being on this show today, Stephanie, and sharing everything. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me back. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to find more episodes of the Hello My Quilting Friends podcast, check it out at leahday.com slash podcast. We have a player that will play through all of the episodes shared so far, so you can binge listen for hours on end. Until next time, let's go quilt.